This may come as a shock to you, but India is large. <laughs> Truly, OSP delivers only the most insightful of analysis. But really, it's easy to forget the sheer size, density, and diversity of this subcontinent. The ancient and medieval periods have a lengthy and ever-changing cast of cool states and empires spread out across the many river valleys, mountains, and coasts. As I've previously lamented, this turns map making into a downright perilous endeavor. But after 1500, we trade map simplicity for cast list complexity, as India sees the arrival of Diet Mongols and a metric Europe of colonizers. So, to see how a mosaic of medieval Indian states got thrown into the blender of British imperialism and came out as a modern nation, or three, let's do some history. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today by going to squarespace.com slash overly sarcastic. When last we left our game of squish a landmass the size of Europe into one cohesive story, the Muslim Delhi Sultanate was shrinking back towards the north, and Mongol splinter states were hanging out on the other side of the Hindu Kush mountains. One such ruler in Central Asia named Babar was descended from both Tamerlane and Genghis Khan, but you wouldn't be able to tell that from his military record. He got kicked out of his ancestral homeland and spent 20 years trying to set up camp in India during the early 1500s. It was attempt number five that successfully toppled the Delhi Sultanate and established the Mughal dynasty, but his troubles endured. This poor guy wrote in his journals wondering why forts and cities along the Ganges River weren't welcoming their new ruler with open arms, as if for some reason a conquering stranger wasn't a normal feature of the neighborhood. Babar also complained bitterly about the Indian heat, so I'm filing him under guys who just can't seem to win. Babar's son wasn't much better off, getting exiled in 1540 after a string of defeats and only reclaiming his capital in time to die by falling down a steep flight of stairs. So his son Akbar took the throne in 1556 and treated the Mughal empire to a king who wasn't existentially clumsy. Akbar's five decades on the throne and a series of smart reforms quickly brought the empire to its peak. He overhauled the imperial government to actually make it work, he added native Indians and local princes into his Muslim-majority government, and he worked to blend the cultures of India and Persia. In doing so, Akbar made people and scholars of all religions feel welcome. This is probably the height of state-supported Indian diversity, and while some were rather off-put by the increasing cultishness of Akbar's trans emperor worship, most Indians were just happy to be included. His reforms also made the economy go smoother on account of standardized taxes that could be paid in cash, which also let them tax the merchant trade. And the Mughals didn't leave all that cash collecting dust in an imperial treasury, they turned it into cold hard architecture. Like this. And that. Shiny. The other half of imperial expenditures went towards conquest, expanding the Mughal Empire down the Indian Peninsula and back out to the Mughal heartland of Central Asia. This, by contrast, went on to be ruinously expensive for almost zero actual benefit, and later Mughal emperors pursued a policy of why not more empire without considering just how much money they were blowing to make it happen. By the time of Akbar's grandson Aurangzeb, the empire was covered in spiffy monuments and positively baller forts, but it was nearly broke, the government was squabbling with itself, and the army was too bloated to do anything. After Aurangzeb died, his sons were too busy fighting a civil war to realize their empire went poof, and within a half century, the Mughal kings were made into vassals of the fast-growing Maratha Empire. What they lacked in numbers compared to the unwieldy Mughal armies, they more than made up for in organization and effectiveness. So after about a century and a half of flying high, the kingdom was crumbling, Delhi got sacked by Persia, and the Mughals were confined to figurehead status from then on. Normally, this would lead to a quiet couple centuries in Indian history, but this time, there were colonies to be made. So let's wind back the clock 200 years to see what those wily Europeans had been up to in the meantime. After Vasco da Gama realized you could sail underneath Africa without no clipping off the edge of the map, Portugal became the first European power to reach the coast of India. During the 1500s, they built two dozen coastal and island forts around the peninsula and developed a robust system of extorting innocent merchants for protection money. Their actual imports consisted of mostly Indian pepper, since it was very expensive for how little cargo space it took up. But but all that aside, Portugal's presence in the Indian Ocean wasn't much more than a passive annoyance since the Mughals were able to smack them around if they ever tried to muscle in land. India might not have seen much of a change, but Portugal carted back a mountain of ill-gotten treasure, and other European seafarers wanted their turn on the carousel of cash. So in the early 1600s, the English, Dutch, and French created private companies dedicated to exploring and extorting the East Indies. By 1700, France, Britain, and the Netherlands had their run of the Indian Ocean because the Mughals did didn't have a navy to speak of even before they nosedived into irrelevance. This power vacuum made the Europeans bolder, and in a classic case of, well, if someone is gonna conquer this place, it might as well be me, they started throwing hands about it. 
This came to a head in the Seven Years' War between technically everyone, but really England and France. Despite the request of King and Parliament to not build a land empire in Asia, the British East India Company saw too much potential profit to let their power slip. So they rolled up to the French allied state of Bengal, usurped the king, and annexed the entire state. Yikes. In the following decade, Britain's victory in the not seven years long Seven Years' War let them push France out of India, and by 1800, the East India Company was well on its way to subduing the entire subcontinent. The British Empire had, again, politely requested that the EIC not colonize one metric Europe, but it was way too easy. The company had a private army of a quarter million Indian soldiers on the payroll, and they had a lot of success in playing small Indian states against each other. And sometimes they didn't even need to fight when a well-placed bribe would get the job done. So the conquest cost a pretty penny, sure, but it was almost entirely consequence-free. Ah, corporate geopolitics. The stuff of nightmares. Now, beyond simply extracting tolls from trade and bringing all those good silks and spices back to Britain, the company upgraded to tax collecting. They also owned the land, so the EIC shifted agriculture away from dumb, low-margin stuff like food to focus on cash crops like cotton and, starting in the 1820s, tea. While early company governors had ruled indirectly by way of vassal princes and at least pretended like they wanted to treat the native Indians fairly, the mid-19th century saw all of that go away. The company dismissed the native princes, forced the farmers into tenancy, and put tradespeople out of work by shifting production to the industrial factories in Britain. But it's all okay, the East India Company's stockholders were seeing a really great return on their investment. So it's worth it. Priorities. Now, if you were, say, a native Indian steadily watching your rights erode as your absentee overlords drained your land of everything it's worth, this was enough to ruin the mood. But in the 1850s, life got even harder for the legions of Indian sepoys fighting in the EIC army. They faced religious discrimination, pay cuts, no promotions ever, and the increasing sense that white British officers were never going to take a dark-skinned person seriously. Meanwhile, local lords had their lands confiscated on ever more dubious grounds, and in 1857, a rebellion of one sepoy garrison and quickly set off a slew of revolts across North India in an attempt to give Britain the boot. The company met this unrest with characteristic extreme brutality and massive destruction to farmland, which combined for a body count in the hundreds of thousands. At this point, Queen Victoria and friends decided that the EIC had lost its existing privileges, so the company was dissolved and control of India passed directly to the British Crown. From 1858 onward, the British Raj nominally made life better for Indians with the creation of an Indian civil service and the partial recognition of sovereignty to a a series of princely states, but in reality, the Raj was just a more official system of wealth extraction and racial oppression that had been going on for over a century. British advisors had final say over the independent principalities, and participation in the Indian civil service was limited to candidates who could take an entrance exam in London. Tells you a little bit about who they wanted running the place. And this contributed to a revealing double standard of how Britain and India viewed the empire, or, you know, Britain and anyone else for that matter. In London, you'd see the fruits of humanistic multiculturalism in food, art, demographics, and mind-numbing economic power. But back in India, it just looked like some domineering colonizers came to take the shiny stuff and stomp on the rest to satisfy a racist power trip. Naturally, this led leading Indian politicians and thinkers to consider the potential joys of not being oppressed. And in 1885, the Indian National Congress pushed to give Indians a greater voice in their own government, but Britain's counteroffer was that they would get nothing and like it, a shockingly effective negotiating tactic thus far. Now, at this point, it's seemed like there was no way this finely tuned system of colonial exploitation could possibly come undone, but we've got to remember that this whole enterprise was a cash grab, so if India ever stopped being profitable, why keep it? And nothing will sink a profit margin faster than a good old-fashioned world war, <laughs> better yet, two of them. When war struck in 1914, the Dodge supported the Entente against the Central Powers with supplies and soldiers. This got a little awkward when Indians heard the British propaganda calling World War I a fight for democracy, as they could be forgiven for not realizing that Britain was into that. So it became harder to reinforce the post-war same old, same old after India sacrificed so much for Britain's war. In World War II, Deutschland Boogaloo, India provided two and a half million soldiers, loaned some 10 million pounds sterling to the British government, and provided critical supplies 
supplies at tremendous cost to India itself. To make matters worse, Britain went all scorched earth on their own province of Bengal to deter the Japanese Empire from muscling into eastern India, and three million people died in the resulting famine. And our old pal Winnie Churchill remained fiercely imperialist throughout the end of the war, offering only the most flaccid concessions of greater Indian sovereignty. But by 1945, London was cleaning up a metric blitz, the empire was bankrupt, and Indian leaders like Gandhi were intensely campaigning for independence. So Britain cut their losses by just letting India go. Still not the least bit interested in India's actual well-being, the British Viceroy organized a partition and complete dissolution of the Raj in just five months. The government had one semester of college to draw new borders and fully withdraw. The basic idea was to make a Hindu majority India and a Muslim majority Pakistan, but demographics don't work like that, so after a partition in 1947, there were millions of people that found themselves on the wrong side of these new borders. This ensuing mass migration quickly devolved into extreme violence and produced an animosity between India and Pakistan that endures to this day. <coughs> Dark! So, that wraps up our history of India and also now Pakistan and Bangladesh. For many reasons, it's a tough history to grapple with because there's so much going on over such a great length of time. But as we've seen, the sheer diversity of people, cultures, and historical happenings makes this corner of the world so fascinating. That said, it does make it kinda hard to write a comprehensive and satisfying concluding paragraph. But you know what's easy? Make it a website with Squarespace. If you've got a business or a really sweet project or a colonizing operation that you'd like to disguise as a spice trading company, a professional online presence is essential. And Squarespace is your one-stop shop for building and maintaining a beautiful digital home. Whether you're designing a site to showcase art and music, promoting a restaurant, or running a storefront, Squarespace has you covered with year-round support and it handles all the icky back-end HTML jazz so you never have to fuss over patches and updates. We love the OSP website that we built with Squarespace because we're able to collect our channel, merchandise, art, social media, and personal projects all under one shiny roof. Plus, my resident editor Indigo uses Squarespace for her personal website, and she's a big fan of the integrated analytics, which shows how users are engaging with her site. Customizing your site is a breeze, so we bet that you'll really love what you're able to create. So when you want to get started, head over to squarespace.com slash overly sarcastic to begin your free trial, and when you're ready to launch your darling website into the world, use code overly sarcastic to get 10% off your first purchase. Purchase. That's squarespace.com slash overly sarcastic, and thank you Squarespace for supporting educational content. Thank you so much for watching. If you think I've been ragging on Britain too much, I kindly invite you to buckle up, because the rest of this year has a lot more where that came from. But in any case, I want to thank the patrons here who make this channel possible, and I will see you all in the next video.